Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, meet the Asus Cephrus S GX531GX. HID Evolution was gracious enough to loan me their review unit, and they have done what they do best and have applied liquid metal to the CPU and the GPU, as well as installed Fuji Poly thermal pads. I will provide links in the description below for this particular product through HID Evolution, but starting price on this typically runs around $3,000, and then from there, upgrade to your heart's content. That model includes the i7-8750H, an RTX 2080 Max-Q, we have 16 gigabytes of DDR4 at 2666 running in dual channel, but one of those DIMMs is soldered on the board. This was necessary in order to maintain one of the thinnest and most powerful gaming laptops ever designed at a whopping 0.62 inches, while minimizing the impact of thermal efficiency. For storage, we have a single 512GB Intel NVMe drive running at around 1500-900 read writes respectively. We have a 60 watt hour battery that was really only good for about an hour and a half to two and a half hours. Perhaps the die-hard battery saving enthusiasts can eke another 30 to 60 minutes out of this. And the network interface card is an Intel 9560. I do not believe this is removable and it is very tiny. Okay, so two things right off the bat. One, the battery life. Now this is an Optimus technology laptop. I was pretty surprised by that. No G-Sync available on this particular Zephyrus S. And with the battery life being as low as it is for a decent sized battery at 60 watt hours, perhaps you were expecting a little bit more. Well, it just so happens that the 2080 Max-Q is constantly being summoned off and on. It'll sometimes run at 3.9 watts. I've seen it pull 9 watts all the way up to 11 watts, just doing various things such as surfing the internet, opening up various apps and things like that that should normally not ping the GPU. So what this means is that the dedicated battery enthusiasts out there can go into their settings and force those apps and the things that they do to only run on integrated graphics. This takes a good deal of effort from the individual and may be a lot more time consuming and effort put into than the average Joe would of course want to uh, participate in. Uh, furthermore, having one dim slot available and the other one soldered. Please understand, there is no room under there for another dim slot. If one were to exist, it needs to be very close to the CPU in order to minimize the length or and distance of circuitry. Therefore, where are they going to put it? If they stack it on top, the laptop's no longer going to be 0.62 inches thick. If they put it on the bottom, same thing, we're still going to have a thick laptop. If they put it over to the left or the right, that's going to compromise the CPU cooling or GPU cooling that we have under the the hood of this particular machine. So you may not like it and I may not like it, but it was one of these decisions that they kind of had to make or have a cooling solution that would be relatively lackluster. Let's proceed. The power supply unit is a 230 watt brick. It is appropriately sized, especially when compared to the brick that came with the Y740 and is very similar size to the unit that comes with the Aero 15. All three of these are 230 watt bricks. This Zephyrus S only weighs 4.6 pounds and feels very premium in your hands. It's all aluminum, top notch build quality, and it's well balanced in your hands regardless on what side you carry it from. Look at the thickness comparison between the Y740 the Aero 15, that laptop is very thin, and now compare it to 0.62 inches thick in a 2080 Max-Q. <laughs> Moving on to the I.O., over on the left-hand side we have the barrel power port, a USB Type-C Gen 1, two USB 2.0s, and the combo audio microphone jack. In the rear we have an HDMI 2.0B and a Kensington lock. And over on the right hand side, we have a USB 3.1 Type-C that offers DisplayPort 1.2 and Power Delivery 3.0. This port allows you to charge from portable power packs, fast charge smartphones and other devices, or use up to a 65 watt power adapter to ultimately minimize bulk while on the go. And finally to the right of that, a USB 3.1 Gen 2 Type-A port. Now the Zephyrus S opens with one hand with ease. 
but I really like this magnetic type clasp that keeps the laptop's lid closed when carrying it around so it's not flopping around. And when you open it up, there's a bit of a catch before it opens up, and when you close it, right before it gets down to the end, it snaps shut. I really hope this feature is standardized in the future. Unique to the Zephyrus design is this lever mechanism. Opening up the lid opens up the bottom plate and allows the Zephyrus to consume fresh air. With the main advantage being able to put this on your lap or perhaps the couch or bed and the laptop can still breathe. But please do not put this on your lap when you are putting this under a heavy strenuous task. That bottom plate is aluminum and it can get quite toasty. Due to the design, the trackpad is uniquely located to the right of the keyboard. It uses Windows Precision drivers, it actually gestures and works flawlessly, it has dedicated buttons as well, and the trackpad can actually turn into a number pad at the push of a button. Aside from the keyboard being shifted forward to help aid in thermal performance, everything else felt pretty normal. The keys have about 1.2 millimeters of travel, the deck itself is reasonably stiff, and the maximum temperature reached was 40 degrees Celsius. The power button is located at the top right and has a very satisfying click, but there is no Windows Hello on the Zephyrus S. The plate above the keyboard allows for direct air intake access for the fans. So not only can the fans pull in air from the bottom, but they're also pulling it in from the top and then exhausting out the back. It's one of the key features that allows a laptop that is 0.62 inches thick to be as thermal efficient as it is. So another thing I wanna demonstrate is keyboard ergonomics. So with the keyboard being shifted to the front, this means that in order for you to have you know, proper shoulder and arm length symmetry, you are gonna have to have the keyboard and whole entire laptop rather pushed relatively far back. This way your arms are at a very similar length. Don't overlook this because traditionally you would have your hands up here and the mouse here and you're going to be positioned about four or five inches closer. And when it's on a 15 or 17 inch laptop, the further away you are, obviously the more difficult it is going to be when it comes to, you know, viewing. And if you decide to put one hand here and the other hand here and have your left elbow bent, this could cause a little bit of discomfort over lengthy periods of time. Should you decide to you know, lengthen both arms, you're literally going to have your body shifting this way. And again, that could just cause some ergonomic issues. Is it minor? Perhaps, but it is something worth mentioning and I don't see a lot of people talking about it. So there is that. Moving up to that full HD 144 Hertz, three millisecond IPS display. The display uses part number AUO82ED. Post color calibration actually came at 98% standard RGB, 70% NTSC, and 75% Adobe RGB, brightness at 317 nits. Now let me know what you think of the webcam and microphone. Built-in 720p webcam and microphone are located at the top of the bezel. In my opinion, the webcam is a little bit above average, while the microphone is one of the best tested on the channel within the last year. Picking up keyboard strokes is hardly an issue with this microphone, and under a silent or balanced fan profile, you should have no problem not annoying the person on the other end with those fan acoustics. The must-have proprietary software is called Armory Crate. You open this up using the ROG key, but you'll have to close this with the mouse cursor. The software controls power profiles, fans, the 4-zone RGB for the keyboard, including one LED on each side within the bottom panel intake. The ROG logo on the lid uses a red lens and is lit from the backlight of the LCD itself. The software is even smart enough to recognize that when you have unplugged your power supply unit from your Zephyrus, it'll dim the backlight, it will lower the refresh rate from 144 to 60 Hz, as well as automatically configure the power and acoustic profile to silent. Plugging it back in reverses the process. It's very smooth, simple, and I really appreciate this level of effort from Asus. Purchasing your laptop through HID Evolution, for a small fee, they will apply liquid metal to the CPU and the GPU. This will not compromise your warranty. Their craftsmanship is outstanding. All the safety precautions there, the correct Kapton tape, the foam barrier around the PCB to prevent spillage, grade A work here. All right, folks, now on to the good stuff. All testing done on BIOS 302 with an ambient temperature of 70 degrees Fahrenheit. 
GPU-Z reveals the NVIDIA spec thermal throttling to be at 87 degrees Celsius, and Asus respects that here. Starting with the CPU, running A to 64 in balanced mode allows the CPU to settle at 45 watts. Running the system software in turbo allows the CPU to pull up to 60 watts. Now you'll initially see higher wattage near 90 until the system takes over and dials itself in, do not worry. Now combining A to 64 for the CPU load and Heaven benchmark loop for the GPU load, you'll see that turbo still allows the CPU to pull above 45 watts. Still not enough to maintain 3.9 GHz on the power-hungry 8750H, as this kept our average CPU frequency around 3 GHz. However, running the same test in real time, but with an undervolt on the core and cache of negative 0.125, you'll see our CPU frequency increase a few hundred megahertz. Thermals are still in check here too. This is impressive given the 3 8 of an inch thickness the chassis gets to cool an 8750H and a 2080 Max-Q. And this is all thermally possible, mainly due to HID Evolution's liquid metal application. Now let's move on to GPU performance and frame rates. Battlefield 5 Ultra settings, no undervolt, and turbo mode running, you're going to get around 90 FPS on average. Now notice the GPU utilization is lower than obviously desired. Not all software is ready or capable of taking advantage of a 2080 Max-Q at Full HD resolution. But, look what happens when you introduce DX12 and ray tracing. Now we have pushed the 2080 Max-Q with strong GPU utilization, fully maxing out this game. When you have Full HD and a GPU this powerful, you really have to focus hard on saturating that GPU, as this is a lot easier to do with higher resolutions, something I really don't recommend manufacturers focus on when it comes to 15 and 17 inch laptops. We don't need any stronger pixel density than we have now, and window scaling is relatively poor overall. Now here we are in Far Cry 5. This is where I want to further demonstrate just how this 2080 Max-Q can be a quote-unquote future-proofing GPU. High settings were averaging around 90 FPS with an average 75% of GPU utilization. But when we go to Ultra settings with the HD Texture Pack, we're averaging the same amount of frame rates with an additional 10% average GPU utilization. However, certain games, such as Witcher 3, can take advantage of our 2080 Max-Q. Ultra settings with hair works on level 4, Turbo, no undervolt, were averaging 90 FPS. Now compare this with the same exact settings in the same exact location with an RTX 2060, and there you're going to take a good 40% hit. Here's a sample of the performance bump in gaming when the turbo profile within the Armory Crate software can take advantage of this powerful hardware. As you can see here, the balance profile average FPS is in the mid 80s. And now when we activate the turbo profile, we're averaging near 100 FPS. The reason being is in balanced mode, the GPU is pulling 80 watts, and in turbo mode, it's pulling 90 watts. Very clever there, Asus. I really like what you've done here. The incredibly popular Apex Legends, the highest settings, is giving us between 100 and 144 FPS, which is the cap in this title currently. In order to achieve this level of performance on the RTX 2060, I had to lower several settings versus all maxed out on this 2080 Max-Q. Overwatch completely maxed Ultra and even ticked all of the Epic settings, which is something not normally done. However, we're still maintaining 100% render scaling. We achieve 160 FPS average, rarely falling below the panel's refresh rate. Here we have a stock Fire Strike score of nearly 20,000. Notice the GPU power pulling 80 watts. Fire Strike running the Turbo Profile, nearly 22,000 points. 
And notice here that the GPU power is pulling 90 watts. And with turbo running ray tracing, 4600 points. Now with all that said, should you desire the automatic fan curve, you're going to average around 48 decibels. Peak decibels in turbo will hit 54. Idle fan acoustics come in at around 31 dB, provided you're running the silent profile, and you'll have idle temps in the mid 50s. So can the audio of this machine overcome the acoustics? Not only can it, but it's some of the best sounding audio in its class. Have a listen. Last but not least, the BIOS has a very modern aesthetic to it with your standard settings. Nothing out of place here, however I do like the ability to disable hyper-threading just for a good bit of fun. So there it is folks, the 2080 Max-Q inside the Zephyrus S, probably the smallest and most powerful gaming laptop on the market right now. With the main shortcoming ultimately being the battery, and the rest of the shortcomings are sort of due to the design itself, whether it's RAM upgrading, storage, and various things like that. Asus simply did this. They gave us the thinnest and most powerful gaming laptop that you could have, and it is built incredibly well. If you can handle the rest of the shortcomings and embrace the amazingness that this thing has to offer, then perhaps this laptop is for you. That's going to do it for now. That is my conclusion of the Asus Zephyrus S.